know anything stupid that I say in the next two hours is going to be uploaded at some point at the Karl Schurz house in, in Freiburg. And then you can look it up again. So, um, basically, um, this is information. This is, these are some texts that I already talked about last year and Wolfgang thought these women are interesting. And that's how we actually found the topic of talking about 19th century women. So for some of you, this may be repetition, but I don't think for too many of you. Basically, I'm going to talk about uh, American local color. Local color is the name that was given to a certain type of literature that uh, was written in North America in the late 19th century. It's a very special type of uh, a very special type of um, careful, that's not read. It's a very special type of, of realism that focuses on um, the kind of reality that is very genuine. And it's genuine in a sense because uh, it has local roots. It's supposed to be the literature um, about um, local um, knowledge, people who really know um, what they're talking about because they come from this area. And the idea was sort of uh, that you wanted to map the United States, which has a lot of different states and regions. And for every region, you had a specialist who was basically telling people what the real thing is all about. So ultimately, I'm just going to talk about what I know. And uh, my strategy is basically just to, to give you notes familiarize you with some texts that I consider interesting and important. Um, and my idea is to motivate you to read um, later, to read some of these texts and to get excited about this type of, of literature. I'm not going to, you know, give you a fancy theory about all of these texts, but I'm, I'm simply going to present some of them. The texts are very selective and they're basically classics in many ways. So the first one um, that I'm going to talk about um, is fairly early. It comes from 1861 and it's by Rebecca Harding Davis and it's called Life in the Iron Mills. Um, so this is uh, very interesting because it's not really a typical local color type of text, but it's a uh, a text that deals with the industrialization. It deals with workers, and curiously, it doesn't deal with them in a sense, uh, in the sense of a communist leftist approach, but it deals with their plight from the angle of a of a Christian type of compassion, where the people are, or the the narrator is basically describing how they suffer and what their life is all about. Um, this text was first published in the Atlantic Monthly, um, which is a name that you should remember. It's uh, the most important literary journal in the United States at that time. It's a leading literary magazine coming out of Boston. And it's a very interesting magazine full of uh, fiction, poetry, essays, political discussions, um, um, and fairly cosmopolitan because the editors were trying to teach the readers also what was happening in Europe, for example. So what is interesting about life in the iron mills, um, and I'm just, you know, these are just a couple of, you know, key words that uh, the reality is very much connected to metaphysics. There's a lot of hellish imagery. That's one point that is very important that I'm going to talk about. Um, clearly, there's an accusation of, um, of industrialism. Um, and you have a victim, which is the man called Yu Wolf. Um, notice that he's called Yu, which um, is, is like the second person um, addressing um, the reader possibly and helping the reader to identify with this person and the man is called wolf and we'll find out later that's because he is 
hungry. He's not hungry in the sense of suffering, but he's hungry for a life. He wants to have an exciting life. He wants to, to, to have a fulfilled life. And his life is basically being stolen from him by the work in uh, hell, in a sense. So, of course, hell is ugly. Um, the iron mills are ugly. And this is contrasted with a urge for beauty, a hunger for beauty. And you, Wolf, is actually a man who can um, create statues, who can create um, 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 figures out of coral. Coral is basically a kind of waste material in the iron mills. It's dirty. And in a sense, he can make out of something that is like, um, you know, dirt left over. He can make uh, this angel figure, which appears in a story, and he can create something very beautiful. So anyway, important is that there's a lot of Christian imagery and you're going to find out this. Um, so the individualism of this person um, selected to write about contrasts with the anonymous hired uh, masses, you know, the, the workers who are basically clearly not individualized. Notice also that the narrator is a Quaker. So the Quakers um, have a religious motivation. This is very important. They are um, a, a, a small religious group, a Protestant group, um, who were actually the first um, group in the United States to protest against uh, slavery in a direct and well-organized way. And it's no coincidence that here the image is a Quaker woman who is, of course, also protesting in this text against um, a kind of industrial slavery. Anyway, this is very complex realism and it comes uh, somehow before the local color movement. This is just a, a page, the beginning page that I um, um, copied from the Atlantic Monthly to show you the reading experience. Um, small print. Um, as you remember, as you know, paper is expensive. And so you, you, you have lots of small print in these magazines and the people used needed glasses sometimes. And they were basically, you know, reading then um, this whole um, text, which is in one um, volume um, in, in the April um, issue. Okay, so this is already what I told you about the Atlantic Monthly, very, very interesting magazine. Um, that still exists. Uh, nowadays, it's called The Atlantic, still published in Boston and, uh, and uh, an interesting source of information. But it's especially powerful and relevant in the American society, um, the educated American society in the late 19th century. So basically, um, you have a narrator and uh, the narrator is... is um, looking at this broken angel figure that I already told you about at home and then telling you um, uh, about her story, her experience, okay? Um, the dumb appeal upon the face of the Negro-like river slavishly bearing its burden day after day. So these are, these are basically the people going to work and uh, of course, nowadays, we wouldn't say Negro-like river, but the association is that this is a kind of slavery, um, that it's demeaning and they're not treated like real human beings. Later, an expression like the slow stream of human life. Uh, um, later on in American naturalism, um, um, 40 years later, you know, you would have images that are very, very similar masses besotted faces they're dirty and then she says i want to make this a real thing to you she wants to basically um show us what this uh, 
worker experience is all about and uh, and promises in the essay to do that it's the story of you wolf um and his crippled cousin called debra um careful i can't read my whole um slide here their lives were like those of their class incessant labor sleeping in kennel like rooms eating rank pork and molasses drinking so this is like lower classes um and the issue is basically that they're they're doomed uh the city of fires that burned hot and fiercely in the night so iron mill you know it's hot it's red it's clearly devilish that's my interpretation but i think that's quite obvious um and these people are lower class they're like they don't have a sense of beauty in a sense that's not um, their life experience hmm? if you could go into this mill so he takes she takes us along and she talks about a reality of soul starvation of living death that meets you every day under the besotted faces on the street um, and the interesting thing about this character you wolf is that he um he has some learning and he molds figures out of coral out of this waste material because he has a fierce thirst for beauty to know it created to be something so existence itself somehow is connected to this whole project of creating beauty which may possibly be a late romantic kind of issue but it's also um, um, a certain psychology that basically says it's not only physical starvation but it's basically the soul that is starving and he's looking for life in a certain type of beauty and he's able to create um, this type of beauty okay here's my phone i don't sorry julia i can need a moment sorry okay life is complicated with kids um so the hunger he's hungry he's thirsty that's why he's called wolf remember and so the question is he hungry for whiskey he's not huh? um so um basically we have different sentences like that he's a great sculpture people give him um they make compliments but nobody really helps him we hear that he's washing your hands in eau de Cologne. this is a reference to pilot but it's it's pretty funny huh so there are these philanthropists you know who say things like a man may may make himself anything he chooses and then the potler that is you know the poor man you wolf says will you help me what is happening here is that there's actually educated visitors who come to look at the iron mills um, this is almost a kind of slumming you know they're basically descending into this hellish place you know to have a look at these um um you know low level human beings um and they like his 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 art but they don't do anything they don't help him will you help me and then there's a character called mitchell who says why should one be raised when myriads are left this is a very typical sentence for the period because it reflects the attitude of social darwinism the whole idea was that you could not you know um raise you know everybody anyway and that you needed social darwinism you needed a kind of uh, um, survival of the fittest um, a selection that would basically you know make the best people stay on top and the result of this is of course that you don't really help the poor people they throw some money at the the girlfriend deborah um which basically you know shows the attitude of the upper class bourgeois visitors who um are meeting are meeting them they don't feel concerned um you who is obviously a man of feeling 
a man of uh, of of, of uh, emotions who has a sense of beauty you know um he feels dirty in comparison to these people um he's very frustrated you know what am i worth deb huh? um is it my fault that i am no better so in a sense he has it in him this sense of beauty this ability to create beauty but it's not recognized he has no chance so um he finds money on the floor actually deborah finds it and he dropped out of the um out of the coat of one of the visitors so this is the first part of the story and then we move on to a sunday morning where the christian reformer is preaching um and uh the issue is actually that uh sunday morning dr may is reading the newspaper and he reads in the newspaper that you got a penitentiary sentence a prison center sentence of 19 years because he was stealing money from one of these kind visitors so um, what happens is actually that he finds that money he keeps that money he's found out there's accusations that he basically um, stole it and so then he ends up in prison and Dr. May, who is one of these visitors who was there, then says it serves him right after all of our kindness that night. Uh, because these bourgeois visitors, they felt, you know, you know, they looked around, they showed interest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, obviously, you Wolf was not grateful. So he's now, he's now in the jail um he doesn't want to have a lawyer to defend him and he basically says the money belongs him that's what Haley, the jailer says there's a jailer there's a, a figure who is important there and uh we realize that uh you wolf is also very sick he has bleeding lungs which is a, a common type of industrial illness you know the people don't live very healthy and then he tries to escape but he's too weak and then three days later he tried it again and he fought like a like a tiger okay which sort of reminds you of this figure of christ the tiger that we found in in literature um you know the tiger is associated curiously with a christ figure okay um then Haley also notices that there's this hunchback woman, which is his friend Deborah, who, you know, makes uh, uh, this statement, oh boy, not that, for God's sake, not that. And of course, Haley doesn't understand what's happening, but basically um, the issue is that um, you Wolf wants to commit suicide. And she's terribly worried about this. Okay. So he is, oops, careful. Uh, he is in the in the cell, and outside the window, you know, there's a market. It's like a picture out there, and he actually envies the dog, which is walking after his master, because even the dog outside has more freedom than he has. Okay. So Deborah basically waits in the cell next to him and she hears a dull bit of tin not fit to cut coral with. And uh, and she is in cold sweat because she understands that this man is committing suicide and cutting his, his veins. And then the narrator says, soon his dumb soul was alone with God in judgment. A voice might have spoken for him from afar from far off Calvary, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Do you understand that this is basically a scene where the um, poor industrial worker is compared to Jesus Christ? You know, he's like a martyr. And, uh, and basically the idea is that the narrator, you know, creates a, a victim figure who is... Uh, 
a, a Jesus type of person. Uh, so on the next day, you know, he's dead. His, his friend Deborah is holding the head in her arms with the ferocity of a watchdog if any of them touched the body. Um, this is interesting. It's a, I consider this a kind of Pieta figure, you know, where you have um, the body of Jesus Christ, the dead body um, that is held by, by Maria. Um, some of you know the famous Pieta um, by Michelangelo. But what is interesting is that that her um, her sorrow is is very very um, aggressive somehow, and and this is then when the Quaker woman enters, and that is our narrator, who who um, and uh, she asks her, did did her know you? Did did you know you? And then she says, I know you now. Um, again, this pun on you, I think, um, this whole sense of Christian empathy that is uh, important. So you is buried three days after, note the three days, and then more biblical references like Esau deprived of his birthright, because his birthright is the right of any human being to lead a decent life. Um, and an honest life, uh, um, um, you know, a good life. So, in a sense, then, um, the Quaker woman is the one who remembers the story, who tells us the story, and uh, she has this statue of the angel that you, Wolf, created in her study room, and it points east where God has set the promise of the dawn, so there's hope for a new day. Uh, in the meantime, you know, she looks back and here I want you to again just see that there is this, this hellfire imagery. The iron mill is a city of fire, of fires that burn hot and fiercely in the night, fire in every horrible form, pits of flame waving in the wind, liquid metal flames rising in torches, streams through the sand, wild cauldrons, filled with boiling fire, over which bent ghastly wretches stirring the strange brewing, and through all crowds of half-clad men looking like revengeful ghosts in the red light, hurried throwing masses of glittering fire. It was like a street in hell. Even Deborah muttered as she crept through, it looks like the devil's place. It did, in more ways than one. So this is, is just... Um, basically a, a very quick introduction pointing out some of the main issues um, of an interesting early text written by um, an American woman. Um, showing you, you know, this interest in, in the industrial um, oppression of people and at the same time also showing you that the um, perspective on this is definitely a very Christian perspective. You can you can be saved through um, human compassion. Okay, I just have a stupid um, reading list, <laughs> a list of names that I'm going to talk about. Um, so um, what is interesting is then is is that when we talk about Beecher, we have to talk about the multiple beachers. Now, this is very, very interesting. So um, let me first start with the older sister. Most of us do not know that um, Harriet Beecher Stowe had an older sister who was called Catherine Beecher, um, running the Hartford Female Seminary, and she wrote plenty of books. What is interesting about her is that she's an anti-suffragist. She did not believe in women's right to vote and was uh, in many ways, you know, um, claiming that the woman's place was home. Huh? A treatise on the domestic economy for the use of young ladies at home and at school. Huh? Um, okay, physical um, well-being is important. Calisthenics, you know, what you have to do, physical exercises, you have to do stretching and all that. So the woman also has to keep the family healthy. 
um, with her sister Harriet Beecher Stowe, the American Woman's Home. You know, these, this is the origin of these magazines called, you know, Good Homekeeping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then an interesting text, Woman's Profession as a Mother and Educator with Views in Opposition to Woman's Suffrage, <laughs> published in 1878. So you realize that she's basically, you know, she's telling the, the woman has to be a mother and she can also be a school teacher. That's possible. But politics um, are something that is clearly delegated to men. So I hope you get you you see, and I'm just very superficial about this. You see that there are these clear role divisions between the men and the women for Catherine Beecher. Catherine Beecher has a a little sister called Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she's become much much more famous. Um, she is the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, who was you know a gigantic bestseller in the anti-slavery movement. Um, and like in the first text on the iron mills, you realize that Christian emotions are, are very, very important. Harriet Beecher Stowe is in many ways also connected to sentimentalism. Here's an interesting footnote. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe at one point lived in Hartford, Connecticut, and she was a next door neighbor of Mark Twain. Um, this is quite interesting. If you imagine, you know, who is Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn? What kind of stuff does he write? Who is Harriet Beecher Stowe? What does she stand for? And it's interesting that they, you know, they were next door neighbors. Um, and actually, um, maybe the topic of sentimentalism is something that connects them because um, Mark Twain can also be extremely sentimental in his books in, in certain situations. So anyway. Um, what you have to understand is Harriet Beecher Stowe comes from a family of ministers. So she basically, you know, again, church religion is extremely important. Um, her father is a, a minister, Lyman Beecher. They had 13 children, you know, just imagine, um, of whom some were very famous. I already told you about Catherine Beecher. She also had an older brother called Henry Ward Beecher, um, who was a, a minister in Brooklyn, in uh, New York. He was a big abolitionist, and he was in his time the best paid Protestant minister in the United States. So he was extremely successful. It's very interesting uh, and very famous, very, very famous. Um, you know, I mean, today he would probably be some kind of a television evangelist or something like that. And he had similar types of problems because at one point there was the so-called Tilton affair because, you know, there was a lady in his, uh, in his uh, congregation called Mrs. Til Tilton who was married to Mr. Tilton. And then, um, I don't know the details, if he had an affair with her or if he did not, but there was a gigantic scandal and he lost quite a bit of his reputation because uh, he was basically having an affair with one of the church women in his congregation. Very sad story. But then going back to Harriet Beecher Stowe, she's the little sister and she's married to Calvin Elvis Stowe. This is why she's called Stowe. And he's of course a minister again, okay? So um, women were not ministers in those days. And so when uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe starts writing and writes this wonderful anti-slavery book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, she basically, you know, says that she wants this to be a kind of sermon. It's her way of preaching. So because she's not um, a man, she cannot be a minister. She cannot preach, you know, from the pulpit, but she can preach with her texts. Um, remember, notice again, Christian elements are extremely important in those days among many people who write. So, um, but I want to share with you at least one text that I think I even uploaded in a, uh, I uploaded a collection called Old Town Fireside Stories. And this is a typical local color type of uh, of text 
where basically um, she's describing um, the situation of a minister who has a housekeeper. Um, and so um, the minister is Parson Carol, whose wife died. And uh, there's a girl called Cousin Holdy who is keeping house for him. Um, and we learn about her. She was one of these uh, facultized persons that has a gift for almost anything. So basically it means she's very practical. And of course the minister is totally impractical. And I want you to notice that there is a little bit of, uh, of criticism of the male perspective in this story. So basically they're they're talking, they're talking together. Um, Miss Amaziah Am Piperich, what kind of name? A widow with a sna with snapping black eyes and a hook nose, huh? Is talking to Deacon Blodgett's wife. And they put their heads together, talking about things. They're basically, you know, worried about this intimate um, situation where the parson, you know, lives in a household with uh Aldi, the girl who does the housekeeping notice also there's a lot of uh, realistic um, 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 dialect in here in the spelling the doctor he had nothing to do careful he had nothing to do but just sit stock still and uh, meditating on jerusalem and jericho and them things that ministers think about but Lordy Massey, he didn't know nothing about where anything he ate or drank or wore from or went to. His wife just led him around in temporal things and took care on him like a baby. Huh? Obviously, he's a doctor of divinity at Cambridge College. He has a, you know, that's Harvard University where basically everybody became a theologist. And I hope you realize that um, there's an interesting very humoristic kind of description of the man who is totally impractical and who always needs a woman to to take care of things. Um, one example here is the wonderful um, turkey episode where they breed chicks for ja Thanksgiving and then the hen turkey is killed and uh, um, by accident and the parson says, but the other turkey is a fine bird too, he is. And then Holdy says, but you know, he cannot sit on the eggs. I never heard of a Tom turkey would sit on eggs. Okay, but the parson has no idea about what women do and what men do. So basically he takes the Tom turkey, the male turkey, and just sits him on the eggs. Uh, and the result of this that is, that is, of course, that all the eggs are, are smashed. So this is the type of, of humor, you know, that you have in these old town stories. Um, and you may think it's a little bit quaint, it's not all that exciting, but it's quite interesting to see how open uh, a woman like Harriet Beecher Stowe is actually talking about this. Okay, so um, what happens then is that Holdy sits down, he's sewing and singing, so she's a wonderful girl, and suddenly the people notice that in church, the parson's sermon got to be like Aaron's rod that budded and blossomed. <laughs> Interesting imagery, you know, um, we can, if you're a Freudian, it's clearly phallic Im imagery and it shows you in a sense that he's uh, probably falling in love with his uh, housekeeper. Um, and there's gossip, of course, you know, um, all these women, you know, um, such a young girl to be setting her cap for the minister. Um, Holdy saw folks nodding and winking. So there's a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of this uh, um, um, allusions uh, and so on um, about this new relationship. And then what happens is actually that they get married. So this is very interesting. Um, because the old ladies, you know, who have been, you know, talking negatively about Holdy and her affair, um, they're basically um, totally impressed. Uh, 
because on the next Sunday they walk into church arm in arm. They're now husband and wife. Um, and Miss Pepperidge, you know, that hard, you know, hook nosed woman, you know, um, who has been gossiping, you know, um, is, is doing a great bounce like a corn popping on a on a shovel, you know, like popcorn. This is very interesting. Um, and then the parson at the end says, as folks wanted to talk about Holdy and me, I'd give him something worth talking about. And this is basically then the, the happy end. Of course, the story has to be nice, um, well-rounded. You need to have the marriage at the end. But I still wanted you to notice the irony in the voice and how much she's, she's basically just making fun of, uh, of the minister. So there is quite a bit of feminist criticism, or let's say simply female uh, criticism of men prerogatives of male prerogatives. Um, okay, so another person I want you to know about is Kate Chopin, um, who is extremely famous for her, her story, Desiree's Baby, which is in almost any anthology. Kate Chopin is actually um, from Louisiana. She's uh, from the South. So in our, um, in our context of local color, she would be a person adding color to the image of the American South. Uh, so basically she represents the South. Desiree's baby is a, an interesting story about uh, miscegenation and race. And uh, I don't think it's a perfect type of story. It's a little bit uh, didactic, but I think it's, it's interesting. So what happens is that um, there's a lady called Madame Valmondé, you know, they're speaking French down there in Nouvelle Orléans, and she's driving over to the next plantation to see Desiree, her daughter, and the baby. So we realize there's a mother, there's a daughter, Desiree, who just got married and who has a baby, and we learn that Desiree was actually um, adopted, and Desiree was found asleep as a toddler, prevailing belief is that she was left by a party of Texans. So please note, Desiree is a wonderful woman. She was a beautiful girl, but we don't know too much about her origins, which is going to be important in the rest of the story. So she has a husband called Armand Aubigny, who falls in love with her. You realize, you know, the upper class, they travel to Paris and then they go home. Um, and they warn him about the girl's obscure origin, but Armand is in love and he does not care. This is a very, very interesting um, part, moment in the story, because it sort of deals with this whole idea that love can overcome racism. This is an important issue in many of the Southern stories that deal with black and white society. And very often uh, it doesn't work. There's a, another case that I know, um, Charles Chestnut's famous novel, House Behind the Cedars, where we have a very similar situation where a white man is marrying um, uh, a girl and he doesn't know that she has black blood, quote unquote, because she looks very white. And so what happens is actually that uh, the young man falls in love, but then later comes the racism and he drops the girl. This is basically the standard story that we're going to get. So what happens is that the mother visits the family and the house is looking sad. The roof came down steep and black like a cowl. This sounds like a line out of the house of the fall of the house of Usher. Um, and Desiree doesn't realize anything. She says, you know, the, the baby is drinking milk, little cochon de lait, and she's very happy. Okay. Um, and she, um, careful. This is terrible. I can't read my own slides because there's all kinds of information on it. 
um, whatever. She has Sandrine, who is a black slave. So Sandrine is black and she's taking care of the fingernails. Exactly, that's the word, the fingernails of the baby. And what you have to know is that in the, the legend of the South, very often fingernails were considered to be the place where you could find out if a person was really white or black. So this is a, a first hint that there may be a problem about the baby's race. Huh? And, and so Madame Valmont is worried. She looks at Sandrine. She compares the color of Sandrine and of Desiree. Okay. Anyway, Armand is a, a, a proud man. Um, we have this interesting description, the husband Armand, his dark and handsome face. Um, okay, so he's happy, but his darkness is, is something interesting. Uh, as you know, there's like a, a very conventional sense that women are supposed to be, you know, white skinned and light skinned and men have a, a darker complexion. That is a standard type of gender stereotype in those days. But here in the context of, of race, darkness, of course, may mean all kinds of, of other things and get things complex. It may also mean that he's a, a darkish devil, a, a person who's not very nice. That's a, another um, possibility. So anyway, what happens is that at one point um, when the baby is three months old, you know, it starts to look dark. And this means that uh, Armand is, is no longer looking at the baby. Um, he's unhappy. Um, he seems to be obsessed with the very spirit of Satan and all that. And basically Desiree at one point realizes, you know, when she compares, you know, her baby to a little quadroon boy, to the little quadroon boys who were like light skinned slaves, she realizes that her child is too dark. So there's a suspicion because we don't know where Desiree came from, that she was probably not white, not pure white, but of mixed blood. Okay. And then she tells Armand that my hand is whiter than yours, you know, and then he says, your hand is as white as the hand of La Blanche of the, you know, the, the quadroon slave, because as you realize many of the slaves you know, were, um, you know, um, um, mixed people and they didn't have very dark skin. But you realize that the relationship between these two people becomes bitter because there is a, a question of, um, of race coming up. And then at one point, the mother basically tells um, Desiree to come home because the mother loves her daughter anyway, whatever race she is. Um, and uh, Desiree basically shows the letter to her husband in a sense, like asking him, should I go home? And then she was like a stone image, silent, white, motionless after she placed it there. Notice that she's white. Also notice that she's petrified, um, possibly through the male gaze. Possibly the male gaze is also a race gaze that basically turns the person into some kind of an object. And then um, she basically leaves. She walks across the desert, deserted field, which is where the stubble bruised her tender feet. This is a, a wonderful image showing, in a sense, the, the pain, you know, that she feels and how much it hurts to basically, you know, that when she has to go, go back home. And then, of course, comes the end of the story. You know, at the plantation, Armand decides to burn everything that reminds him of his wife, um, the cradle, the gowns. Um, and then finally, he finds a bundle of letters in the back drawer. In, and there are letters between his mother and his father. And then, at one point, he reads in one of the letters that unfortunately their son doesn't know that his mother, who adores him, belongs to the race that is cursed with the brand of 
slavery. So what we learn at the end is that Armand basically is prejudiced uh, against the um, race of his wife when actually um, the one who um, has so-called black blood is actually himself and not his wife, his wife Desiree. Um, so in a sense, this 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 shows you, you know, the injustice of racism, the stupidity of racism, how you basically tend to make accusations in the wrong in the wrong direction. Um, on the other hand, it's clearly it's clearly um, a story where. Uh, what shall I say? It, it's clearly a story where a white woman is not really dealing with the real situation of black Americans or slaves. She's very much concerned with her own white um, prejudices about about racism and how they are affected by it. Now, the one story that I absolutely want you to read is the story of an hour. I when I discovered that story, I was just so impressed. It's a fantastic text. Um, it's very, very short. It's easy to read and it's great fun and it's just powerful. Um, it's basically about a, a lady called Mrs. Mallard who has heart trouble. Now, as you know, heart trouble is a medical condition, but it may also be a love condition. We don't know about it. The text is at the beginning fairly ambiguous about this. And then they tell her that her husband died in a railroad crash. And the story focuses on the caring relatives um, who take care of her because she suffers because her husband died. Um, she cries, of course, immediately and she retires into her room and everybody around her is totally worried about, you know, um, is she going to survive this terrible, um, 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 you know, accident? This is this is awful. But what is interesting then is that the focalizer goes from outside to inside the room where she's basically opening the window. There's rain outside, which may have all kinds of uh, symbolic meanings. And we read, she was young with a fair, calm face. Those lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. This is this is interesting because it's somehow announcing a future you know if you're young you can still go somewhere and it's uh, it's talking about repression she's been oppressed or, or she's had to adapt but at the same time she's strong so she's a person who might go somewhere or do something and this is where the story becomes interesting because she has an interesting feeling something is coming to her this thing that was approaching to possess her and she was striving to beat it back with her will and what is funny is that she has the wrong feelings you know she's supposed to be a widow who is totally sad that her husband died but instead of that you know the wakened stare and the look of terror give way to a monstrous joy that held her so curiously her emotional reaction to the death of her husband is utter happiness uh, and so you certainly realize you know there's an interesting relationship between men and women um, at that time in the united states at least in this type of society that is described by Chopin. We read, you know, and this is again focalizing through her, there would be no one to live for during those coming years. She would live for herself. Huh? There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. So you see here that this is quite critical about marriage and she's enjoying 
that she can be, she can live her own life. She can live for herself. She will somehow be free. And then that's what she says, free, body and soul, free, she kept whispering, whispering. Um, so freedom is an important American word, but this is this is also interesting. You know, think about women's liberation. This is really about liberation. Huh? Outside, the relatives worry because they don't hear anything. They bang on the door. Um, but inside, she was drinking the very elixir of life through that open window. So basically, the window connects her with nature. This is very important. Um, she fancies that all so, all sort of days would be her own now. The days are my own. Um, I'm absolutely impressed to see how m many of these ideas, even the words, you know, anticipate somehow, you know, the, the whole argument in Virginia Woolf's a room of one's own, that one wants to have a place where one is not controlled by usually um, a man. This is very important. Uh, so this is, you know, you can say in Virginia Woolf, there's a, a reference to space, the room of one's own. And in our story, there's a reference to time. She would have more time for herself. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory just amazing amazing statements um that show you you know how this this woman has a totally unexpected different reaction and then what happens is that suddenly the door opens notice that the door opens in the apartment um doors keys I mean always uh control uh, very important. And then the husband comes home, Brentley Mar Mallard. He enters a little bit travel stained. Huh? So you have this, you know, the key that enters. Okay, I say that's a phallus. Why not? You know, it's like the man entering, you know, this home where she basically had already gotten ready for her freedom. And then we learn that he had been far from the scene of the accidents. He took a different train. He was not on the train. He's still alive. Huh? And so um, they try to screen him from the view of his wife because they think his wife is going to have a, uh, you know, a shock when he's suddenly alive, you know, because she has this weak heart, but it's too late. And we hear that when the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease of the joy that kills. Okay. So what happens is that um, Mrs. Mallard, actually, when she finds out that her husband is alive, she has a heart attack and dies because she had already reorganized her life of freedom. And then suddenly the man, you know, with the key in his hand is coming home and she realizes that this whole notion of freedom that she had will never exist. But this is totally inverted on the outside the people don't see what's happening they think that it is the joy that kills she was so happy to see him that she died so the plot has a kind of inversion wrong medical diagnosis um i think it's wonderful work with the focalizers this is this is really really interesting so there are all kinds of exciting things that can be said about this story but I'm not the, the man who owns it. Um, there's a lot of people who can talk about it. And uh, the best thing that you can do is that when you go and read it yourself and figure out yourself what you think of it. I'm just mentioning on the side, not giving you an interpretation of this. Um, um, her, her famous text, most famous text, which is a feminist classic, is The Awakening. Um, which is again about New Orleans society and it's about a lady called Edna Pontellier um, who then uh, withdraws, um, who is in relationship with Robert. She has a, a lover um, um, and um, whom she meets on a vacation and then her lover basically um, disappears for Mexico 
um, when um, her husband um, is on a business trip, she has an affair with a suitor. So there's clearly a kind of sexual thing happening. Um, Robert then comes home to New, uh, New Orleans, confesses his love, and, uh, and, and things get very complicated. Um, her friend Adele, you know, who is giving birth to a child, which is the proper type of thing for a woman, warns Edna to behave in a proper way. And so what happens is actually that um, Edna is in love with Robert, but she decides to leave, uh, leave forever. And there's this extremely famous scene at the end when she's uh, committing suicide, drown, drowning herself in the Gulf of Mexico um, and feminists have made a big thing about this because in a sense the death is at this the suicide is at the same time um, a gesture of self assertion uh, assertion of determinism of, uh, of of gaining her own freedom plus you know she's uh, um, becoming a part of the water of the fluidity which is an extremely important um, feminist feminist image um, but I'm not going to give you an interpretation of this I'm just mentioning this this is a longer text that she has written and it's extremely famous and I'm clearly not not an expert on it but I think um, She's an important writer. She's a name that you that you should remember. Um, my favorite discovery in many ways um, um, among these local color um, writers is Mary Wilkins Freeman. She's a really interesting person, an interesting writer. Um, she writes about New England. Um, this is the name of her her most famous uh, collection of stories and uh, many of the topics are about women who are in conflict with traditions that restrict them um, or who find alternative ways of living um, um, among women without men. Um, and this is quite interesting. Uh, and her stories are immensely readable and Tons of fun. I give a forward in a moment. Okay, sorry, my daughter coming in. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have, but I'm going to skip this story, The Revolt of Mother, which is a very, a very nice one, simply because I probably don't have enough time, except that here you see her sitting next to Mark Twain. Uh, again, this is very interesting. Um, but I like to talk about the story called the church mouse, which I think is is really hilarious. Um, it has a wonderful open uh, opening sentence. I never heard of a woman's being Saxton. Uh, um, and then there's a reply. I don't see why they shouldn't have women Saxtons. And you realize this is a dialogue between a woman, Hetty Fifield and Caleb Gale. Caleb is working in the field, he's a farmer, and he's the deacon of the church, and the church basically uh, doesn't have a sexton, and she's a woman, and she would like to have that job and live in the church and take care of it. Um, so she basically tries to convince him that she can clean the church, ring the bell, cut the wood, keep the church warm, etc. Um, she's looking for a job, obviously, and then the question is, where is she going to uh, to live? This is the main issue. Um, Hetty is described as as sallow as a squaw, uh, and she had pretty black eyes. They were bright, although she was old. Uh, and there's a wonderful sentence. Suddenly, she raised herself upon her toes. The wind caught her dress and made it blow out. Her eyes flashed. So you see, in a sense, she's a, a woman. She's old. She's small, but she's making herself big and trying to start a fight. This is supposed to be, uh, you know, a, a person who wants to defend herself. 
So she basically then says, I'm going to live in the meeting house. Remember the meeting house in New England in those days simply is the church. Okay. Um, um, yes, meeting house is, is low church. This is very Protestant, um, the type of thing. So she says that she wants to have a corner in the gallery of the church, church for her cooking stove and her bed. Uh, and Caleb, you know, is still working as a farmer and she's he's not really listening to her he tries to ignore her but she challenges him and she says where am i going tonight then because it looks like she has no home uh, um, so this is the the first situation and it's a bit complicated and we're you know encountering two people and we have no idea exactly what happens uh, she blackmails him because she has to move out of her old home. So we learn that basically she's an old woman who's been kicked out of her house. And she says there is no poor house here and I, I, I ain't got no folks. So because she has no family, basically there's no place where they can send her. And we get a little bit of background of uh, the situation. So, Caleb doesn't really know what to do. This is very typical again in some of these women texts. The men have no clue. They have, you know, they don't really know how to how to organize things and when there's a conflict. So Hetty is waiting and she says, I suppose the key is where Miss Gale can find it. And so she manipulates him and she pre-structures his decision because she wants to get into that church and find a place to sleep and uh, and have a job mm -hmm. with her small eager face she moves forward like an animal to the large cottage house um, notice small eager face this is of course the image of the church mouse and you know in the church you have a poor mouse very often this is the image that is used um, um, for her and then she goes back to the to the house where she used to live and in front of it there's a little knot of household goods basically um you say a knot of of wood you know like firewood um so the imagery basically shows you that it's not extremely valuable property that she has and it's not a whole lot there's a woman at the door. She was small. There was a black smudge on her face, which was haggard with fatigue. And she scowled in the sun as she looked over at Hetty. And then she says, and then we find out she has no room for Hetty. Um, the house now um, belongs to a different family. Um, she's expecting her mother-in-law. Um, so um, there is no room for Hetty. She has to go. Um, the image of the woman also signals that women do have to work hard. You know, they're pale, dirty sometimes. Um, and obviously you get the sense that this is a woman who is under the thumb of her in-laws. Huh? Okay. Hetty then goes to the neighboring little hut where there's a lazy tall youth called Sammy and she wants to help wants him to help move her things huh? and and um, his mother says he ain't able to lift much he's not very strong and Hetty then says I suppose he's able to be lifted ain't he you know to be lifted this is a, a religious um, concept you know that God can or religion can improve um, your personality. So anyway, she has picked up her things with poor people um, and she stays in the church for three months and then there is trouble. Um, because basically, you know, uh, she's ringing the bell and she pitched her tent in the house of the Lord. Um, she um, beautifies the church and you realize in a sense that she is uh, changing the habits of the villagers, changing 
the whole um, village. Yeah. But she basically now has a stove in the church and the bed, and uh, and she's, uh, you know, living there. So we get background then in the in the story. This is very typical because these are realistic stories. Um, and so we learn why we have this odd situation about Hetty. We learn when the old woman with whom she had lived died, the town promptly seized the estate for taxes. So she has lived with an old woman, which is in itself interesting because it might be some kind of Boston marriage where old women live together. Um, but basically because the woman didn't have money to pay taxes, um, the house is taken away and uh, Hetty, who is of course not married to the woman, that's not possible, is just a surplus person and is kicked out of the house and the house is sold to these uh, poor people um, who own it now. So you realize here, this is a sign of collective greed where basically the town is collecting the taxes and leaving Hetty homeless, which is why they have the responsibility to give her a job to take care of her. Uh, like, yes, we, we, we learn that she's not paid by the old woman, so she has no income, which may again signal that the relationship between these these two women was not one of a house owner who pays, you know, a housekeeper, but it may have been a, a friendship. Okay. So basically the town is described as a settlement of narrow minded, prosperous farmers. The farmers, they want to make money. And, uh, and of course, um, there are problems when they kick out somebody like uh, Hetty. There's no arms house and no private family was willing to take her in. So we realized that she was probably not a very lovable person. Hmm? We read Hetty had an unfortunate name in the village. Okay. Um, and she's described as a fierce little animal with claws and teeth bared. So she's really defending herself and she wants to have a place to live. But there's stories about her. Uh, Notice here, this is the, you know, the kind of old witch type, you know, the, the angry um, old woman, um, the cliche of the evil tongue. This is very, 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 very interesting. Let me also add to you uh, another point in these New England stories about women is, of course, you have a lot of these single women. Um, they're like all over the place in uh, um, late 19th century American literature. And that is basically um, because of the Civil War. You know, there's this image of the spinster, which is the woman who is living alone. And that was uh, a reality in many ways, also because so many of the young men had died in the Civil War. So you had a surplus of women and uh, and a lot of these women were, you know, by themselves and they had to make do and, and try to survive somehow. So anyway, um, Hetty is quite practical. She does handicrafts. She decorates the church, you know, with wool flowers and wax. Um, almost savored of poppery. She, she, she's almost adding too much beauty in the church for these uh, Protestants. Huh? But the real problem is that she's cooking and uh, when the people go to church, the church smells of the, you know, uh, of turnip, turnip, turnips of the food and they think that is very difficult. And so Caleb basically thinks they have to find a place uh, and they say she can stay with somebody called Susan Radway, um, who is a good Christian woman. But what is interesting is that Hetty, who seems to know who the person is, totally refuses. She says, no way am I going to stay with this lady. Mm. So uh, um, Hetty doesn't want to negotiate. She doesn't want to move out. She doesn't want to stay with this other lady. Um, and so the, the men, you know, um, the church uh, deacons, they don't know what to do. Huh? The three steady, sober old men did not want to drag an old woman by, ma by main force out of the meeting house. Of course, they don't know how to solve 
this conflict. And so Caleb then sends for mother. Mother is uh, what old men call their wives. Uh, so that's the, the, he calls for his wife to help him because they don't know how to solve this problem. They don't want to be really violent, you know, that doesn't work. And that's when the difficult thing happens because Hetty basically closes the door of the church. She slips the bolt and turns the key. She locks herself in the church. A wonderful story. Um, notice that in this story, it's the woman who holds the key and who turns the key is, is, is very interesting. So then you have this wonderful scene where the men try to open the door and they bring all kinds of keys and they try all kinds of keys, but none of them work. So the men, you know, as owner of keys, basically uh, they fail. Um, they, they cannot enter the church and this pesky little woman called Hetty basically, you know, makes it difficult. We read key after key was tried. The men brought all the large keys they could find. Okay, so I leave it to you to interpret that wonderful imagery. Um, and then the, the windows were fast. Hetty had made her sacred castle impregnable except to violence. So this is interesting. It's almost like she's protecting her, her realm, like she would be protecting her virginity. You know, there's like sexual metaphors that translate into um, personal dignity metaphors um, that are very, very important. And so the, the scene gets very complicated. Now the women start complaining about how this situation is handled. And then at one point, a man, uh, at one point, a man appears with a crow bar to open up the door. And then Mrs. Gale tells her husband not to break down that door, you know, wonderful imagery here. And, and Hetty basically um, looks out of the gallery window um, and we read that magnitude of her last act of defiance had caused it to react upon herself like an overloaded gun. This is really, really interesting. You know, the, the defiance, you know, and uh, the magnitude and the power of it is compared to an overloaded gun, which uh, I think, again, you know, may hint at some kind of phallic explosion and reminds me very much of Emily Dickinson. It's interesting. I have no idea if she knew Dickinson's poem <laughs> or what that means, but it's, it's, it's curiously similar imagery. So basically then she gives her speech, you know, and says how her heart, her life was and that she doesn't want much. She wants to have a home, uh, a small home, a place to be her end, her words ended in a week while and then what happens is that finally um, the deacon's wife mrs gale arrives and she says don't worry mrs gale stood majestically and looked defiantly around tears were in her eyes so you have this this queen type of strong woman who obviously has a certain kind of power there's a, a solidarity between the little woman and the big woman um, against against the man. And then she comes with this wonderful proposal. Why couldn't she have the little room side of the side of the pulpit where the minister hangs his hat? So in the church, there's a little room um, and it's it's basically available. And why should why doesn't she have it? Because it doesn't have much of a function. It's just a place where the minister hangs his hat. Now, as a, as a Swiss, I know that the hat is a symbol of power in William Tell. And, 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 and it's, 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 it's very, very nice how this is composed, you know, from the, the point of view of symbolism, you know, where basically the place where the minister, you know, used to, to place his, his hat, you know, the person of male authority is now actually a place where the, um, the woman can enter. So they basically find this uh, female solution and the case is, uh, is settled. And two days later, we hear that Hetty has a happy Christmas. There is no one to molest her 
or disturb her. This is interesting. This is a sentence that I found in many, or, or a situation I found in many of these texts, that the women basically just have the desire to be left alone. Uh, um, and again, uh, this shows me that Virginia Woolf is not just that genius, you know, who had an idea of wanting to have her own place, but that there were many women um, in those days dealing with these issues and that this was something very common that people uh, were talking about. Christmas has never been a gala day to this old woman. Christmas had not been kept at all in this New England village, remember the Puritans, when she was young. Huh? But now she pulls hard on the bell rope and she celebrates Christmas. Hetty had awakened the whole village to Christmas Day. And that is, in a sense, the, that's then the end of the story. That basically, you know, this woman's um, freedom, her finding a new place makes her happy. And it's a, a kind of, a, it turns into a Christmas story at the end which I, I think is really nice. So this is, is a, a, a wonderfully crafted story by, by um, Freeman. Um, and I think that's, that's, just, that's just great. And if I have time, I just want to show you, you know, tell you quickly about another story by Mary um, 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 Freeman. And I'm sorry, I probably will not be able to cover everything that I wanted to, but that's okay. Um, these are good stories, and as long as I can entertain you, that's fine. And as long I can, as I can motivate you to maybe read these stories later. The New England nun is a, ma a woman called Louisa Ellis, and she has a well-organized day. She's at home. She's peace peacefully sewing in her sitting room. Um, we, she's happy, she quilted, she does these women things. Um, her work is folded precisely and laid in a basket with her thimble and thread and scissors. So this is a well-organized um, woman, possibly a little bit stubborn, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, not very creative. I have no idea, but, uh, you know, um, just following patterns, rules. But anyway, she's preparing um, tea because she has a real, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, as if she had a veritable guest um, at home. But what happens is actually she's spoiling herself. She's inviting herself. So this is going in a circle. So this woman basically has herself as a guest. She's preparing tea for herself. Um, you know, very fancy with the damask napkin, cream pitcher, and the whole thing. Mm. And she bakes corn cakes for her large yellow and white dog called Caesar, who is in the backyard. So the only male relationship that she has is with her big dog. This is interesting to see. So again, this is a spinster. This is a woman who uh, lives alone. She um, is happy to live alone. And her only companion is a dog. Uh, so if there's anything male, it's basically the dog. Now, what is interesting uh, is that she get visited, gets visited now by a man called Show Daggett. Um, um, they look at each other. They have small talk. They talk formally. Um, and she asks about Lily Dryers, is with her now, with whom? Probably with the mother of Joe Daggett, who needs company. Uh, he says, I don't know how mother would get along without her. Again, this is a typical figure. This is a, a young girl keeping house for somebody else. And Louisa says, she looks like a capable girl. She's pretty looking too. So you have here a first pointer that, you know, there is possibly a love story in the making somewhere, but this is, is, is very complicated. When Joe Daggett leaves, um, he stumbles over the rug. He's a little bit like that big dog, you know, like the elephant in the China 
um, shop. Um, and we find out that Luisa, on her part, felt much as the kind-hearted, long-suffering owner of the china shop might have done after the exit of the bear. So Joe Daggett is a bear, very much reminiscent of that dog that she has, and she's visiting, and we have no idea why he's visiting. So we get the background. He's visiting her twice a week nowadays because they are going to be married. And you wonder, okay, what kind of formal relationship? Why are they going to be married? And then you get the background. 15 years ago, basically, they, they were courting uh, each other. But the problem is that for 14 years of these 15, he was away in Australia to make money, to earn money, because you need to have money before you can marry your girl. So they were engaged 15 years ago. And then he left, and now he's back with money. He has exchanged, they've exchanged um, letters and now basically he's coming back and the idea is that they are going to marry. Um, Luisa in the meantime has no longer no family anymore. Um, she's all alone in the world. Uh, but we read that Luisa's feet had turned into a path smooth maybe under a calm serene sky but so straight and unswerving that it could only meet the check at her grave and so narrow that there was no room for anyone at her side so we learn that luisa in those 14 years has developed a lifestyle a habit basically she's used to live alone she doesn't need a husband and that's the issue so, uh, in a sense, she knows exactly what she wants. Um, her life is, is organized, as we saw in that first quotation. Um, and the habits basically become her identity. And the problem now that he's back is that 15 years ago, she had been in love with him. At least she considered herself to be. And we realize that actually there's a promise of the engagement, but somehow she no longer wants to marry him. Hmm? So um, it's it it it's 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 complicated. Joe actually also feels um, confused about this situation. He still admires her, huh? but he notices that there may be certain changes about her. Huh? So he still believes in the love song, but for Louisa, the song had never been more than murmured. Now it had gone down and everything was still. So the problem about the two of them is that they are engaged. They've waited 15 years and now they're supposed to marry, to get married, but they're no longer in love. Huh? Um, so Joe actually has prepared the family home, his old homestead for his old mother, who is a domineering, shrewd old matron. So that's not the mother-in-law in law that you want to have. Um, and uh, Luisa would have to move in there. Uh, but in the meantime, she lives with Caesar, who is her dog, a veritable hermit of a dog. Uh, but he's a nice dog. There ain't a better natured dog in home, uh, in, in town. Joe actually also likes likes this this dog. Um, notice that somehow the dog plays the role of Joe. Joe is also the elephant in the the china shop, um, and the dog is also big and and good natured. But it's a a man who is not a romantic lover or so okay so basically they're supposed to to get ma married um and it's a full moon night so the story continues luisa goes for a walk and then she sits down on a wall separating harvest fields and she hears footsteps and low voices and she finds out that she's overhearing a conversation between joe daggett her fiance and uh, Lily Dreyer, this this pretty girl who who keeps house. 
Um, and Lily says, I'm going day after tomorrow. She's leaving. And he says, I ain't got a word to say. There's no solution. Uh, and, uh, but he says, he's not sorry that yesterday we kind of let on how we felt to each other. So you basically find out that she's leaving, um, but they were talking to each other and they were, you know, telling each other that they liked each other a lot. So you realize there's like this, this other relationship, love relationship that seems to be um, warmer, clearer. Huh? Um, however, Joe says, even though he likes Lily Dreyer, he will not go back on a woman who has waited for him 14 years and break her heart. So you realize Joe is a good guy. He's loyal. If the woman has waited for him so long, he's not going to, you know, uh, disappoint her. And Lily actually says, if you should chill her tomorrow, I wouldn't have you. Uh, so she also believes that a man has to um, to go by his word. This is extremely important. Uh, so so they agree, but you realize, of course, you know that this is a an unhappy family situation. She says that she will fret over it, huh? But then she says, um, I shan't fret much over a married man because for her. He's already married somehow. But she also says, I will never marry another man as long as I live. I ain't that sort of girl to feel feel this way twice. Uh, so she she really states that she's really in love with him. But the situation is difficult um, and uh, she can't really, you know, get married to him. Okay. So what is interesting is that then the story continues. Louisa has, of course, overheard that conversation. And we read that on the next day, she does not continue sewing on her wedding clothes. Um, they finally came to an understanding, but it was a difficult thing for he was as afraid of, betray of betraying himself as she. Mm. So what is interesting is that they basically, Louisa and Joe, they find out that they're not made for one another. Um, and Joe says, I think maybe it's better that way, but if you wanted to keep on, I'd have struck, stuck to you till my dying day. I hope that you know that. So what is interesting is that conflicts just happen. You know, things sometimes go wrong. Um, even though the people are good, Joe is a good guy, Louisa is a good person, um, but um, the, the rules, you know, force them to, you know, um, to marry when they don't want to. And so what is interesting is they can talk about this, they come to an understanding and they decide to dissolve this uh, engagement. Hmm. Um, so, in a sense, they become real friends when they separate. That night, she and Joe parted more tenderly than they had done for a long time. There's a better understanding. I think that is, is really interesting. Uh, they kiss and she weeps a little, but the next morning on waking, she felt like a queen who, after fearing her own domain to be wrested away from her, sees it firmly insured in her possession um, so basically she doesn't lose her home this is also very very important um, i guess we can only understand this kind of materialism in the context of the legal situation where of course a married woman would have to would lose all of her possessions to her new husband this way of course, uh, um, she can keep it, and that um, makes her keep control and 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 keep keep her safe. And then she she keeps on sewing. She gazed ahead through a long reach of future days, strung together like pearls in a rosary. Uh, so, in a sense, she is enjoying 
a well-ordered single life. That's why she's called a New England nun. Uh, Louisa sat prayerfully numbering her days like an uncloistered nun. Um, interesting, you know, just this whole idea that a woman wants to be um, um, alone. Um, she wants to be uh, on her own and she can do that. And there's a, an interesting negotiation of how she how she gains that freedom. So anyway, this is another another story that I I wanted you to um, that I wanted you to um, to hear about. This is very very important. There's tons of these um, authors, and I realize you know I don't have too much time left. If we also want to to answer some uh, have some discussion afterwards. Um, Rose Terry Cook is, in my opinion, not a terribly good writer, but it's it's very interesting and very topical, this story called How Celia Changed Her Mind, which is basically about uh, a, a woman called Celia Barnes, who says, "There's if there's anything on the face of the earth I do hate, it's an old maid. Nobody wants to be an old maid. And please realize again, this was the problem. You had all the spinsters, you had too many women. So there's a lot of old maids. And so basically the only way for a woman to be somebody is to be married. This is very important. Um, and then basically um, the problem is who can you marry? Uh, and it's it's really fascinating to see how these um, um, these texts, how straightforward they are about some of these uh, women's issues. Um, um, so there's a select man, you know, whom she can marry. Um, um, careful. She, okay, she was left to a select man by the poor mo mother who made her a white slave. Um, so basically she's been an orphan and has no family attachment and she's been exploited by men and at eight, age 18 you know she becomes a tailoress and starts become independent but she wants to get married because she doesn't want to be you know an old maid so she gets marriage proposals but look at the choice an old farmer with five uproarious boys um who is stingy and has a bad temper and basically is just looking for, you know, a nanny. Huh? So is that interesting? Or a young fellow of no character, poor, shiftless, and given to cider as a beverage. And then she comments, I have no call to set up a private poor house. So you realize in a sense that these are, you know, very concrete options of uh, what the married life um, can be all about. Uh, so her chances are clearly um, limited and she stays independent. Um, so then she learns a little bit more about marriage. She talks to the minister's wife, Mrs. Stearns, who has two stepdaughters, and we learn about what it means to be a wife. One of the stepdaughters is Katie, you know, she, Katie was married herself now these 10 years and doing her hard duty by an annual baby and a struggling parish in Dakota. So basically, you know, this is a girl who's following a minister who has lots of kids in Dakota, which is, you know, out in the desert, you know, in the wilderness, um, very poor life and hard work. Huh? And then the other case is the other daughter called Rosabel, who chose to fall in love with a man called Amos Baker, and her father considered it a fall indeed. So the father basically doesn't want her to marry this man called Amos Baker, because very probably he's a shiftless young man. Okay, so what basically happens is that Celia, Celia um, you know, um, thinks she wants to help um, and what then happens is that she gets Amos and Rosabel safely married and lends some money 
to elope because she thinks, you know, there's a love story and these two should be in love. Hmm? So she gets a, um, um, a letter from Rosa who then basically, you know, talks about her wild love life. It's, it reminds them of a, a novel, the last novel's heroine. So there's like this, these romantic illusions about love. And the minister himself is very angry at Celia. Angry in the meantime, Celia in the meantime marries a deacon. Huh? And the deacon says, I'm real lonesome since I've lost my partner. He meant his wife. Huh? So basically, she now has her own experience. And she realized that she's being abused as a housekeeper who gets no wages. By the way, this is very interesting. This is, it, these are issues that some feminist theories are, theorists are talking about nowadays, you know, that women are just unpaid workers in a man's um, household sometimes. But she's happy that she will not to die an old maid. That's basically what she thinks. But her life with Deacon Everts is simply um, hell. He always talks about his first, meaning my first, wife she never used but two cod fish and two quarts of molasses she was real sparing you know and celia gets very upset about this so basically she's married and she's in an unhappy in an unhappy um marriage okay so in the meantime basically parson stearns saves his poor daughter who has two babies in the meantime and they're coming home and Celia feels very guilty about this, like a murderess, because she messed up um, Rosabelle's life by, you know, making her elope. Um, and in the meantime, her marriage is not doing any better. Deacon Everts is, ma is malicious. He's remodeling his, his will, leaving all the money to foreign missions. So if he dies, she's not going to inherit anything okay and uh, um, but after he dies fortunately there is a life insurance and so finally again this word freedom you know we've had that in other stories how sweet was her freedom with her characteristic honesty she refused to put on mourning so now celia is free she's no longer married she's very happy and she starts an annual thanksgiving dinner um, um, celebration, Celia invited every old maid in town, seven, seven old told to take dinner with her. You know, so basically she, all the old maids, they reunite in a kind of female group um, because they're free, they're not controlled by a man. Uh, and she says, I'm so grateful to be an old maid again and she adopts also um one of the two one of the two children of roses so this is the end of the story but it's it's not the brilliant type of story but i think it's a very interesting story that that shows you a few very very basic points about women's life um in that in that period and i am really you know a bit of a fan of this local color fiction by some of these women. These are powerful stories, interesting stories. And uh, I never have a student who wants to write uh, MA thesis about this. It's a, it's a pity. OK, let me stop here. And hopefully we have a few minutes to uh, hopefully we have a, a few minutes to, you know, discuss this or raise some questions or make some comments. OK. Sorry, I was just talking nonstop. I'm really terrible. Ilona has a question. Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, I have two questions. Firstly, was the literature written by feminists influential in the fight against slavery? And also, how did the American society view female writers? Because we heard about the British society reaction, but not especially the American way of reacting uh -huh. to women writers? 
Uh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that uh, you know the the Victorian writers, you know, um, um, were in a, in a different cultural environment. Um, women writers were very fairly well respected and fairly successful, and they were were publishing. They had no publishing problems, which may have to do with the Atlantic Monthly, which is a, a magazine that published lots of women. Um, and also um, 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 men and women of color, actually, Jewish texts. Um, what you also have to understand is that in the United States, everybody can read and write. And this is a Protestant country. Uh, there's a very high literacy. Um, and the women are, are the main readers. So they are the consumers of literature. Um, and because of that, there is a, there is a market um for for these books which are bought and read by by a lot of women but 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 you're right when you when you observe that there is a a kind of an issue you know where you you wonder you know were they not um kept from publishing and i'm not a total specialist on this but i've i've never really heard that uh that it was especially difficult for American women at that time to publish um, in comparison in comparison to men. Um, I, I rather know women who were basically, you know, earning a living by writing. You know, we're going to hear about Louisa May Alcott, who basically, you know, created the main income for her her family and her incompetent father who, who couldn't make money. <laughs> so, so, so writing was actually a source of income for quite a few women. There were quite a few real professional writers in the sense that they, they depended on this. But I'm not, I'm not a total specialist on this. I have to say, I'm just dabbling in, in new kind of stuff in a couple of texts that I wanted to show you. And that I, I think are absolutely wonderful and fascinating. I don't know if Maria knows more about this. You've done Louisa May Alcott, you know, that's the same kind of situation, the same questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so for Alcott, I mean, I'm going to talk more about this, but for Alcott, I think it's always really interesting the way that she very purposefully studied her readership and um, was very aware of, of certain texts being successful. So she very much saw herself as a commercial author who needed to make money for her family. Um, as you said, Sammy, so she needed, her family depended on her incomes and she very consciously um, tailored her writing. Um, so we could approach this with popular culture approaches from today and think about um, how she has her readership in mind and she knows what is what of her writing is successful. and offers to do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, she's very productive in that way. And yeah, I, 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 I can definitely say more about that in my session as well. And I know that many other writers um, were definitely under that pressure to, 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 to write texts that would sell well. Um, yeah, so I don't know if this is helpful. There was a market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but but what I think is really interesting is that when I read these stories, that that in this market you can get away with these uh, amazing statements and phallic imagery and and all kinds of of really interesting stuff that that we see today. You know, it's 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 it, it, it's it's obvious to us. I don't know in those days, you know, how obvious it was in these days or how they read it, but uh, it, it's it's fascinating for me. Yes, that's the lady with the number. You don't have a name, unfortunately. How, how I can... Uh... Now I can hear you. Speak a little bit louder. Okay. Can you hear yes. me? Is that better? Now I can hear you. Yep. Okay. So I was just uh, wondering, I mean, um, A, it's, it's a bit later than the British uh, writers we were discussing, so almost a century later. 
And I was wondering um, what the influence of the civil war had on it, because the women um, were at home. I mean, uh, you can compare that to uh, the the female situation uh, in the World War Two, mm -hmm. where all the men's were gone, and and suddenly women had a different role. So I guess that gave them a lot more, um, you know, freedom and emancipation. And you can also now see that in their writing. That's a good observation. I think yes. I think yes. There's a kind of uh, independence. You know, they they knew how to how to run things. They were fairly self self confident because they knew how to how to run a household, how to do a lot of things. You know, a farm is a farm, basically. <laughs> yes, um, and well, in the uh, in the U.S., I mean. Um if they lived more towards the west you know on on a farm they also had to work a lot more or they they had to be more independent it was a different kind of life than um the the british ladies in in their homes exactly 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 and it's in that sense also a different literary culture so yeah. even though even though you know the the atlantic monthly is of course read by the boston brahmins and there is this very educated upper upper class there's much a much bigger middle class type of reading public i think uh in uh, in um, in uh, in in the united states that has this this uh you know that that is connected to the the folks somehow you know I think that is that is clearly is clearly a different a, 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 a different situation. Anyway, I I hope you liked some of these some of these tales and some of these statements. You know, that's for me that is the the main the main issue. I'm not myself, you know, a, a total um, 19th century specialist or women specialist. You know, I do American literature across the board, the whole literary history. But, you know, these are just certain spots, you know, certain elements, certain statements that, that I adore, that I, that I love. And these are some of my favorite, you know, some of the short stories that I, I really think are extremely powerful and, uh, and, and that I wanted to share. That's sort of my contribution, roughly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anybody else who wants to make a, a comment? Yeah, Maria, yes, sorry. Yeah, so um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed this. And thank you so much for this because um, I, I was aware of many of the stories, not all of them, and there are definitely some that I want to check out and and read and hear, find out more about. Um, I would love for you to say a little bit more um, about your interpretation of life in the iron mills, because I feel that sort of stands outside of the other stories, because so many of the other stories are about gender relationships, marriage, um, yeah, religion, religious imagery also links here really nicely. Um, but then sort of this, this one sort of stood apart for the others and you started out with it. So I'd love to hear more about that specifically, because I think in the chat, one of the Participants asked about suicide um, and and sorry what the exact question was, but something about um, the importance of suicide culturally at that time. Um, so maybe, yeah, you can you can address that and say more about that. Um, and but that that is an excellent question about the suicide. I have to admit that I never even thought about it. Oh, this was someone in the chat. This wasn't me. <laughs> someone in the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Mai yeah. has asked that. I see it now. I see it now. But it's it's a very interesting question because uh, you know, um, especially also because of the, the 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 whole religious framing of this whole story, which shows you that religious belief was extremely important. Um, but it's also somehow it's a a religious attitude that is not necessarily um narrow-minded and limited but, uh, but it's it's one that is basically um trying to show tolerance and freedom uh, after all it's a quaker woman who is the narrator um and these are supposed to be very open-minded very open-minded people they don't even organize the 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 service in the meeting house <laughs> they're just quake um 
So this is this is very interesting. I, I cannot give you an answer on the suicide. I really don't understand that. That's a, a good question. Uh, I have to leave that open. But somehow um, um, the author doesn't worry about that as a as a sin clearly because in comparison to the sin that is happening in the iron mills which are clearly described as a hellish place um you know that is 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 less uh, less important um and she's also describing the whole pressure on these human beings you know so there's a, an explanation for that suicide as a kind of a you know, there's no perspective for you, Wolf. He has this hunger for beauty, this hunger for for recognition, for life, and 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 he's just basically basically turned into a uh, an object. You know, this whole mass of of human beings who are totally de individualized in a naturalistic way. Um, it's a fantastic text, I think. It's a really interesting text to analyze and to discuss. Um, it's not a typical um, local color text. I wanted to talk about it anyway. Local color is very often about farms. It's very often considered to be pre-industrial um, type of society. Um, and what is interesting is that, you know, this is, uh, I think, 1861. This is extremely early. Um, and it's basically um, a, a very early text that is is discussing in this industrialization in the United States. Um, I I think it's it's a fantastic text, and it it it, it covers it, it's full of uh, religious vocabulary. You know, washing your hands, um, Pontius Pilate. Um, um, there, there are all kinds of issues, but ultimately, what is interesting, the solution for this uh, negative situation of the iron mills is, is a kind of Christian compassion, Christian recognition, finding that even in a low human being, there is a, uh, there is a, a human being, you know, there is a, there, there, there is a life, there is an identity, there is an individual and recognizing this this very basic equality of Christian, shall I say, brotherhood, exact, as a kind of recognition, which is very different from the class difference of the visitors who are entering the iron mills and, and talking down at the workers. Um, the Christian doesn't do that. Christians are brothers. There's something egalitarian in this type of Christianity, at least, you know. Yes, there's another question. Am I right? Anybody else with a question? Please speak up. Oops. No. So there's a hand up that, that the hand is, is, is not relevant. Okay, good. All right. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm, I'm very happy that you that you listened. You were a wonderful audience. I hope you could profit a little bit. You got some ideas about uh, interesting type of literature. That's that's the main point of 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 why I uh, I I I talk to you. Okay. So the in my opinion, always the most important stuff is the texts, and all I can do is point out that there are some good texts that are interesting and that are are worth reading. Next time we're going to have careful. Let me see who is who is on the program next time. Next time we're going to have Anne Rückemeyer from Freiburg, who is going to talk about Harriet Martineau, and that is a person whom I haven't read yet. So uh, this is going to be something new. This is going to be very exciting. So um, I look uh, I look forward to this. I hope I will see many of you next week. Um, you're always and the teachers are always welcome to be on the sidelines and you know have a peek. Um, excellent. Okay. Anything else that I have to organize for next time? Um, you have access to the information in the um, on the Moodle page. 
And so far, the, the, the speakers have also placed their PowerPoints on the Moodle page. So if you want to go through the PowerPoint again, that is no problem. We have a recording and I will, uh, um, I will now send these recordings to, um, to the Carl Schurz house and I hope they can start uploading some of them, which uh, makes it possible for the ones among you who, you know, had to skip one of the talks or so to, to go back to it and, uh, and listen into these talks. Good. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to seeing many of you next week. Terrific. Bye-bye. Take care.